Good evening. Good evening. Can you please stand? Madiba, Dean of the Faculty of Education. I'm here to welcome you to Professor Liesel Frick's inaugural lecture. A special word of welcome to Professor Frick's uh, family. I've seen, I think it's a full house. There. <laughs> um, uh, Professor Frick's husband, Franz Radloff, is here. And uh, daughter, Nika Radloff. Professor Frick's sister, Tasia Marcos, I'm told she's joining online. She might be watching us now from the USA. So they are also here. It's uh, Jan and Ronika Frick. Then we have uh, Professor Frick's husband's parents, Johan and Susan Radloff. So welcome. All friends, all over, from all over the world. So I have only five minutes. So what I did, I only cut a uh, few. So if you're not mentioned here, it's not because it's not their fault, it is my fault. <laughs> I just cut some of the names because it was not possible for me to be able to, to read all of them. So we, the first one is, I just want to welcome Professor Eric Stark from University of Canberra in Australia. She advised, she's Associate Dean for Research and development in the Faculty of Education. You can sit down, sorry. <laughs> uh, joint doctoral program on higher education studies. I think the few that are mentioned here is Professor Banja Fisher from Watasusulu, representing the SEU from here at DSI NRE, Center for Excellence in Cyto, who is the current chair of uh, CREST. She's attending online. Then we have research, a number of research associates and extraordinary professors who are from the Center for Higher and Adult Education, Dr. Zondi Mukabela. Then on, on online, those who are attending online is Professor Gina Whisker and then Prof. Kisti uh, Paharto. So lastly, for social impact, transformation, and personnel. And then Professor Michael Lugia, who is Vice Dean for Teaching and Learning. Uh, it's my colleague, who is a professor of higher education studies in the Department of Curriculum Studies. Professor Frick has been the director of the Center for Higher and Adult Education since 2017. She obtained her doctorate in 20, 20, 2007 uh, at the faculty's vice dean for research and postgraduate studies. Her research interests fall within the broader higher and adult education field with a special focus on doctoral education that has gained the special interest group on research, research education, and careers of the European Association for Research on Learning and Instruction, which has enabled her to build extensive research networks around doctoral education and supervision. The advisory board on doctoral supervision at the Karoluska Institute, which is Stockholm, uh, Sweden, 2017-2018, and as an invited member of the expert group on doctoral education for the Herrhausen Her 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 Conference on Forces and Forms of Doctoral Education, sponsored by Volkswagen Stechten Hanover Chain Development, and has been invited to facilitate workshops and short courses, leaving an academic footprint in various African and European countries. Her work has earned her multiple awards, most notably the Best African Accomplished uh, Educational Researcher Award for 2013-2014, the 
by the African Development Institute, ADI, and the Association for the Development of Education in Africa. And the other one is the Emirate Literary Network 2012 Highly Commended Award for Hena for Researcher Development together with Professor Eva Brodin from Lund University, Sweden. The National Research Foundation awarded her a Y2 rating in 2013 and a C1 rating established organized researcher in 2019. Her research portfolio includes more than 70 published research outputs and even more conference presentation on a number of occasions as keynote speaker. She has served in a reviewing editorial capacity for more than 20 different academic journals. Prof. Frick is an established scholar in higher and adult. Recent studies here in South Africa have shown that, you know, South Africa is not making very good progress with uh, producing percent of our university's academic staff will have um, a doctorate. But uh, that is not going to, to address challenges such as, such as this one. So without much ado, I will now invite Professor Frick to come and present a keynote address entitled, Not Just Another Brick in the Wall, the Role of Doctoral Creativity in Educating Future Generation of Researchers. Over to you. Both here in person as well as those joining us online, it is indeed an auspicious occasion for me to be able to stand amongst you as a peer, as a friend, and as a scholar. Um, tonight, I need to distribute after the fact, but I'm not going to bore you to death and read from it. Um, I um, who are interested in education and those particularly those of you who are interested in developing um, the future researchers focus the presentation particularly around doctoral creativity tonight. We don't need no education. We don't need no thought control. No dark sarcasm in the classroom teacher. Leave them kids. So these are the, the lyrics to Another Brick in the Wall Part two by Pink Floyd's Roger Waters, which was released in 1979. It's the rigid and abusive forms of schooling. I started my formal school career. For me, it wasn't a happy place, I have to admit, to the extent that what you see at the bottom was my school ruler. <laughs> I have the evidence who desperately protested against going to school. So I never planned on becoming a professor or have anything to do with teaching for that matter. Regardless of my dislike of the formal education system that I was thrown into for 12 years, teacher and also a, a public librarian in a small rural town in South Africa who gave us at that stage planted banned books that we got to read. So, finishing school, as was expected of somebody of my age and upbringing at the time, I got sent off to university to learn. It's also about having fun and meeting people. I probably had more fun than I learned at that time. So, but this evident disjuncture between my own sense of self and it does not escape me. It was only at the postgraduate level that I seemed to find sense and sensibility in formal education. And the route through a master's and doctoral studies nuanced an explorative debate, which was what I really enjoyed and where I truly found myself. It's so important to me. If you read this quote by Carl Rogers, who did the work in the 1940s and 50s, you will see that Rogers does, this quote was picked up many years later, 2005, by a Pope, who's one of us after the fact. We have a lack of creativity, both within our education systems, as well as attribution centered on making sense of this. And particularly during my doctorate, I was often reminded that the doctorate is supposed to be an and I couldn't find satisfactory answers, which made me dear 
that originality needs to be demystified. Because I think it's not really useful for scholars of doctoral education, for people doing doctorates or their supervisors, when you have a kind of approach of, I'll know it when I see it. When people don't see revolving here, sort of a, a taste of the work that my colleagues and I from around the world have been doing over the past number of years on thinking about how do these terms, um, cons uh, how are they mystified concept? And so I'm very pleased that I can helping to develop this field. And tonight is just as much um, giving honor to them that it's really important to demystify the whole notion of creativity to you because it's not to say that we understand the same thing when we talk about what is creativity. But if we were to distill it within the context of, of my um, understanding, I think what is important to understand is what Pope calls the idea that creativity is to make, do, or become something that is both new and valuable as something that can be done, but it's also about the person behind doing the act or whatever is, gets produced. And so it relates to um, what we call the four P's, the person, the process, the product, and the press. Press, how do we make it understand as an educator the following things. It requires understanding rather than memorization, diversity rather than conformity, initiative rather than compliance, challenge rather than acceptance. He relies both on external motivators, so the people that the teachers in the classrooms at school, the supervisors for doctoral students, the mentors for early career, internal motivation of the person to be able to um, be creative and necessarily creative. It isn't necessarily, it doesn't result in real originality, yet it does manifest and we need to ask, why do people not make the choice to be truly creative and develop their originality? as well as um, even to the point of um, mental instability in some cases. So talent can be an important component of it, but it's not the only thing. It can be developed and it can be taught. Um, and particularly at the doctoral level where there's the explicit outcome, the chances are that the people who move on to become the researchers of the future aren't necessarily going to be um, able to be creative and develop expression of a person's potential. So if I were to talk about my own work and what do I profess as a professor, I would say what I profess on the notion of creativity as a core element of that, and you will see that I very specifically don't co-creation, and that's a very specific change in shifting the debate. So to creating knowledge, so that we can have a product that is hopefully original. Features quite strongly in universities' mission and vision statements these days, has a particular meaning. And it is around, is where do we start? And having a process orientation towards education. Into a kind of mutual understanding that we can come from. And so now I want to ask some questions, which I have easy answers to them. I can't give you um, a very specific answer to each of these questions that we're going to focus on um, moving forward. So, I, oops, go back. And I look at my own experience. Creativity is supposed to enlighten us. It is supposed to help us think broader, knowledge systems. Doing really, truly creative research enables us to have conversations with other scholars around the world, draw on their work, take our knowledge fields forward in whichever discipline we are working in. So the counter side of this coin is, although it does offer a passport into the world, at the same time, not all passports can be considered equal. And I can speak from experience of the number of visas that I've been required to parts of the world. Um, through the kind of, of work that I do and collaborations that I have. 
And so it's important to understand that for emerging scholars, it's a really difficult transition to make into this world of knowledge creation. They cannot do it by themselves. So you need to ask yourself, do you have access to that work? And that access is not equal for everyone. For the past couple of years, by necessity, a lot of the work that we've done have been online. But I believe there's no substitute for this kind of face-to-face -face contact. These knowledge systems across the world that, that needs to enable knowledge creation, we need to ask ourselves, how can we disrupt the kind of systems and ideas that disable in different kinds of workplaces? And so some of the work that I've done around global citizenship education critiques this whole notion of, um, of equality in, in knowledge creation, which is often assumed. And we know that from Southern theory and from the Global South perspective, that not to be true. So if I were to look at my own, um, Brent Abrams grac graciously helped me to, to look at my own CV in a more visual way. And for this particular analysis, we looked at my publications and my conference um, presentations, but we didn't look at where I traveled to. We looked particularly on sort of the academic tourism of, there's a conference there, I go because it's a nice place. So if I look at my own footprint over the past couple of years, I've to collaborate with colleagues from literally around the globe, there are areas where I simply do not. Sometimes the barriers may be linguistic, sometimes it may be that there are very few scholars in that particular region working on the same things that I do. This is kind of the, the visualization of my passport, really. Um, and so I think if, if we were to think about the researchers of the future, creative and the most collaborative um, trajectory in terms of their own development. It, it would obviously not look the same as mine. This is a sample size of one and it can't be generalized and nor do I say that particularly about their work within this broader global context of knowledge creation. Where do they want it to land and how do we enable that to happen for them? So my second provocation is around, can doctoral creativity act it? And I feel, I feel very strongly that research should not be considered as an insulation of others. And so we need to ask ourselves, in addition, particularly in the higher education sector. Now, if I look at scholars around the world working generosity, the kind of generosity that many of you here and online have shown to me over the years in terms of you're making your own research accessible to me and creating opportunities for us to collaborate and co-create knowledge. For somebody starting out on a research career are not supported by the generosity of other, others in that, in that environment. It's also, it also requires an openness to change, static or stable. It needs to change and it needs to be challenged. And in that, this requires of us to be flexible adaptable, resilient, um, in, terms of, um, in terms of our uh, cohesiveness. With, and here I want to really refer to the IDER network, the International Doctoral Education Research Network, which has played a key role for me in developing this kind of scholarship over the years. It is an example of where, as the world, where they try and draw in scholars in a particular field, being doctoral education, in order to enable them to grow their own scholarship. And it is established through the generosity of scholars in the field. We need more examples of that nature. But collaboration takes time, effort, it takes commitment, and we need to imagine things to be different um, and better for future scholars. So we need to think about our, beyond our own individual needs, if there are other stakeholders involved, and we need to be open to ways of co-creating knowledge. So if I were to think about my own collaborations and how that looked this, 
If I look at my own trajectory over time, I can see that I started out collaborating. Initially, my networks expanded and included others. In the beginning, it was rather opportunistic. But as we went along and I got exposure to other scholars, I joined other existing networks and drew on their work and expertise and how that is very important to my own trajectory and network. But I got to expand and involve other scholars beyond that initial look. When I look at this, my networks became more international and my collaborations became more international and I started co-creating knowledge together with my students, my masters and doctoral students, which is a really exciting part of the trajectory for me to have that. In terms of, of the current day situation, you can see that some of the networks are ongoing. Some of the networks have sort of faded into the background somewhat. Some of them were once off kind of opportunities while others are longitudinal kind of opportunities. What is interesting about the network is we didn't put my name here. We only used the others' names to see how, if you take me out of it, how, what does it look like then? Um, and so while this is a reflection on my own collaborations across a period of number of years, it is interesting to see how it has shifted and enabled also other scholars to, to collaborate beyond my own investment in this. And so when I think about the future of researchers and how do we develop their creativity through collaboration, I think what I take forward from this is firstly that collaboration takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. You can see over this time trajectory that it took quite a number of years to move from the local to the global. And secondly, that it takes commitment and effort and it needs to be mutual. You cannot have collaboration only driven from one side. So for collaboration to be successful, you need this kind of committed trajectory over time. And if we think about the researchers of the future, how are we going to enable those kinds of trajectories for them to happen? I am really excited about what I see here because not only do I see my only own development, I see opportunities for younger scholars to be included in these networks. I also see opportunities um, how some of these projects can link and feed off each other and have fed off each other, although that might be, not be evident to you when you look at this, this kind of trajectory. So, my, second, my third provocation is around the commodification of the doctorate. Now, often when we look at policies and structures in universities, we see elements like innovation, patents, um, production, those kinds of words, knowledge production, the production of students. And it all has to do with the commodification of, of knowledge. And we become cogs in that wheel. And here I draw on sociologist Manuel Castell's work um, in terms of you know, the universities run the risk of becoming knowledge factories, where what we are talking about is the production of knowledge and it, it ends up knowledge for the sake of knowledge rather than thinking about the creation of knowledge and how it becomes useful to society. And then also on Robin Barnacle's work um, where she critiques the notion of researchers as knowledge workers rather than knowledge creators. And where we, we don't think of the person behind the creativity. We only think about what can they produce and how much of it can they produce. And so when I, a lot of my work has been built around also critiquing these kinds of notions of, of production and I know that the kind of collaborative work that um, I've also done with people like Sue McKenna, who I hope is online tonight, has been, has paid testament to a kind of alternative view of knowledge creation as something that is enabling and empowering to the individual, to groups, to society at large. It, 
doesn't mean that it can't be economically viable, but it means that we not only think about the economic viability of the knowledge that we create. If I think about my own research in, in this area, it's very difficult for me, not impossible, but difficult for me to register a patent, for example, in the field that I work. But I can make my knowledge accessible to others in a kind of commodified way, um, for example, through short courses. So if we were to think about my footprint as a commodity in terms of my field of study and the, the research that I do, the application thereof in the work of others, and I looked here, and Brent again helped me to look at where does it sort of fall, where does it get stuck um, in terms of the work that I do. And you can see from this perspective that even though my collaborations in terms of research stretches across the globe, my footprint and the commodification of my knowledge is much more continental in nature in comparison. So the way in which my knowledge gets, that I develop and co-develop gets taken up in society is definitely more in, 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 in the African context. What has been interesting, and you can see the countries listed there, but what has been interesting for me in terms of this is that there is a slight although not complete, and it, it depends on which country you look at, a slight gender bias. And so this is something that I want to think about more and want to delve into more deeply in terms of the equality of also not just that which we create, but how it is received and by whom. And I think part of my, on, my ongoing work should be to think about how do I enable um, my knowledge to travel more equally. So my final provocation tonight is around the question whether doctoral creativity can save the world. And by extension, implication, can I save the world? Um, that is probably a little bit much to ask for an individual. But as a collective, maybe we can make a difference. And it starts with me. So. In terms of my work around doctoral creativity, one of the things that stood out is that quite often creativity is seen as a universal good. It is something that is expected. It is good. It is, when you use the word creativity, people think, oh, you know, it's something beautiful, it's something good. Yet, creativity is a risky business. It carries risk because the kind of knowledge that we develop isn't always necessarily good. It isn't always, if, if we think about the kind of science that gets developed, think of the atom bomb, for example, developed by scientists. A wonderful example of really innovative work, very creative, yet what did it do to our environment? A lot of the current day technologies that we develop might be good in terms of production, but are they good for communities and societies in which we operate and function? And so if we talk about developing the researchers of the future, I think the important thing for them is to consider their work within this perspective, not just in terms of whether it is creative in terms of the process that they follow, if they're making an original contribution, but what is the outcome of that originality? What if some th somebody were to take your idea and the knowledge and actually implement it? What can they do with it? I think that is a key question that we don't often ask our doctoral students and early career researchers to ask themselves. And so some of the work that we've done have related to, to that particular aspect. And so if I were to continue the conversation, and I hope that I can continue the conversation with many of you in the years to come, in terms of the first provocation, to think about knowledge creation and being creative as a passport into the global world. On the one hand, yes, it can be. But secondly, for it to be, we need to question the equality of that passport and that enablement that we create through knowledge and through the systems in which we function. 
And we need to sometimes be disruptive of those systems in order for our, for our scholars to be, and the researchers of the future to be creative. And we need to challenge and, and, and ask ourselves, um, are these systems in which we function enabling or actually disabling to the researchers that have to go into the future? In terms of the second provocation, whether um, doctoral creativity can act as a catalyst for collaboration, again, I think that it could. But it would require of us a very sp specific strategy in order to enable that to happen. It won't happen by itself. Often research is seen as a kind of individual isolated activity. For, in order for knowledge to be taken forward, I do believe that we need to focus on the collective endeavor and we need to think about ways in which we enable that. In terms of the third provocation, in terms of creativity as a commodification, I think we need to think in terms of at least academe, how do we become creative universities? Does not mean that our ideas cannot be commodified, but it does mean we need to think about the social impact of our ideas and not just the, the monetary impact of them. And the final provocation on whether doctoral creativity can save the world, I do think it can make a difference in small pieces. But one of the things that I've seen is that we're not particularly good in helping early career researchers think about beyond their narrow research ideas. And so if we were to change the world, we really need to help them to think holistically about their creativity and how that creativity finds a foothold in society and actually can make a change to the betterment of it. So I've kept you busy for quite a number of um, minutes now and I think I need to end here and also extend my thanks before I hand over to my esteemed colleague, Professor Le Cordier, who will do the formal thanks. But there are a number of thank yous that unfortunately he cannot do and that I would love to do. So firstly, I extend a thanks to the organizers who have really accommodated my whims and wishes tonight and for making it something that I can remember for the rest of my life including also the rectorate and the management of the faculty and my colleagues who are here from the faculty. I truly appreciate you being here. In terms of my colleagues and collaborators beyond the university, I would like to extend a very special word of thank you to each one of you. Tonight is a celebration of my work, but it is as much a celebration of my works in my wall. I would like to extend a particular word of thanks to my colleagues from the Centre for Higher and Adult Education, <coughs> as well as from Crest at Stellenbosch University. Um, you have been my close-knit collaborators over many years, and I really value your collegiality and the collaboration that you've offered me. I would like to extend a particular word of thanks to Dr. Brent Abrams, who have worked with me on this presentation and who have done the wonderful visual effects that you have seen and I'm truly grateful for your time and effort. I also wish to acknowledge my own students. They are the future bricks in the wall and I really enjoy being a part of their own creative journeys in becoming researchers. In terms of um, my friends and my family who have supported me along the way, and many of you are here tonight or online. They say it takes a village to raise a child, but it takes a whole team of builders to build a single academic. Tonight is again a celebration of your support and encouragement that you have offered me over so many years. I do not take friendship for granted. And I am forever grateful for everything that you do. It is very special for me tonight to have friends here that I've known since childhood and friends that have come across my path in more recent years. And now I have to focus. <laughs>
because the, the final word of thanks goes to the very special people in my life, my family. It is very special for me to have you here tonight. To my dad, you are my benchmark and my true north. Thank you for teaching me to think and demanding that I do so. To my mom, you are a human first aid kit. You are the carer in our family. You anticipate our needs. You clothe us, you feed us, you look after us, and you never ask anything in return. Thank you to you both for enabling my creativity as a child, which I think has partly led me to where I stand here today. France. You are the love of my life and my biggest critique. <laughs> you, sh <laughs> you show me every day what it means not to be just another brick in the wall. Nika, you are my VIP tonight and you are the most important person in my life. I know that you will end up where you need to be. You will build your own walls that are sturdy enough to make you and others feel safe, but that those walls will also have many windows that lets in the sunlight and others' creativity to feed your own soul. And you will have beautiful views that you can share with others through your own creativity, like the artworks that you have given me to include tonight. <coughs> I am very proud of you. I believe in you. And I love you. Thank you, everyone. This is really joy. Yeah. This is celebration. Thank you, colleague Liesel. It's my task not to provide an official response or academic response to your inaugural lecture, but to do a word of congratulations. On behalf of the rector and the colleagues of the rectorate, and on behalf of Senate, a word of congratulations, together with your dean, vice dean, and faculty. You have received from Stellenbosch University a while ago the authority and the mandate to be a full professor. Full professor is actually the most senior academic position. You will profess your discipline, and tonight we got a glimpse of what that entails. Doctoral innovation, broader innovation, through creativity as global passport, as catalyst for research cooperation, as, in my interpretation, constructive societal impact, social impact, also socioeconomic impact. And then, as good news for an unpredictable world of work. And may I add, you triggered me tonight to think about doctoral research as habit formation. My children over the years knew that when I was going to, be, to, to, to work hard and I didn't want to be disturbed, I would tell them, listen, the next two weeks, I'm going to write a PhD. And then they say, okay, we understand, we understand. <laughs> Colleague Liesel, on, on this professorial journey, you will strive to contribute to a university and a society of dignity, of healing, of justice, of freedom, and of equality, as it is phrased in the constitution of this country and in the transformation plan of Stellenbosch University. On this professorial journey, you will be guided by the e-care values 
of Stellenbosch University. The first E, excellence. In a context where there's so much tolerance of mediocrity and even underperformance, we stand for inclusive excellence, as we can witness in your work that you portrayed briefly tonight. Compassion, people in a context of diversity who embrace sympathy, feeling with each other. Empathy, feel ourselves into the skin of the other. And interpathy, meaning we come from different backgrounds, different worldviews, but we think ourselves into each other's skins and we feel ourselves into each other's skins. Compassion. Also accountability. To say, yes, I'll give account of what I'm doing and tonight you were not ashamed of what you're doing. You gave account with humble assertiveness of what you're doing. And the value of respect. To say we will re-spectacle. Look again, listen again, pay attention again. That's the type of institution we want to be and the type of world we want to be. And in conclusion, the last E of E carries equity. To say we want to build through our academic work, specifically also through our professorial work, to build an institution and a society of equity from the Latin aquietas, meaning equilibrium and fairness for all. Tonight, you took us a little forward, a big step forward on this very long journey that we're traveling on. I hand over the certificate to celebrate you and your work. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Oh, you mustn't stand again. Thank you, um, thank you Liesl, uh, for taking me down memory lane in a very special way. You might not think where I wonder where I'm coming from, so please allow me a little, a little short memory. And I, I promise I won't, I won't exceed my five minutes. In the early 80s, I, together with Professor Kropman, we were students at the University of the Western Cape. It was a very trying time in those days of, of our the history in our country, and students were up in arms about what was then called gutter education. And so, this song, Another Brick in the Wall by Pink Floyd, became the theme song of our struggle in those days. Because we said that uh, we hate education that wants to control our minds, want to control our thoughts. Because education is meant to set us free, to set our minds and our thoughts free. So deja vu, but it's just a wonderful, wonderful memory that you uh, take me back to. And so let me thank you from the faculty side as well, before I get to do a few people in person. Thank you for your leading role that you have played so far in our faculty, and especially in the Center for Higher and Adult Education. And as you've mentioned since 2017, we've been working there together, hand in glove, for the, for the last six years. And I can testify that uh, it, it was quality work very, very good work that, we, that we've seen coming from that center. Many students graduated with their masters and their PhDs 
uh, under your guidance, contributing healthy to our departments and our faculties' research outputs. And then, uh, for that, we want to thank you. And I'm sure you will continue to do so. I'm sure you would. Um, I want to thank the organizers as well. You know, Jonathan, Dale Blankenberg and his team. Not so long ago, I had the honor, virtual one. No, I was not so privileged to have it in person. But be that as it may, I can testify that uh, Jonathan Blankenberg and his team, Olivia Adams and Chantal New and everybody, they will go on beyond the call of duty to make sure that the lecture is absolutely perfect, and it was. So to you guys, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your work. To you, Professor Koopman, our Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Social Impact, uh, thank you for representing the rectorate in the way you did. Thank you for congratulating and, 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 and putting you know, your finger on the pulse of what we are supposed to be doing here. And that is you know, to, to guide people in a way where we can so empathy. Because at the end of the day, and I think Liesl asked that question in a final analysis, we all want to, to make a change to society and we want to make a change to our, our world. And, and to the dean and his staff there in the office, you know, those Sally and, and, and Chantal sending out the invitations, making sure people are replying, getting this all together. Thank you. Tonight, tonight we could walk in here and we could, we, we could feel that, you know, this was planned and it was organized and it provided a safe space for us to enjoy the success of the Liesl. And finally to you, everybody, whether you are online or here in person, without you there would have been no inaugural lecture. So, so thank you for being here. Thank you for showing us your interest. And that bell tells us that I, I must stop. But uh, <laughs> so all that remains for me to say is thank you. And uh, you are all invited for drinks and uh, refreshments. And please mingle a bit, clear a bit. Um, take some pics for our newsletter and pics for our website and pics for our social media platforms because we would like to celebrate our success with all of you and also with you, Liesl. It was a wonderful evening and I'm glad you made me part of it. Thank you so much. Thanks.